Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For this week's true crime story, we shall be investigating the crimes of Vaughan Greenwood, who was also named the Skid Row Slasher. Vaughan Orrin Greenwood was born in 1944 in Pennsylvania, America. Little is known about his childhood and upbringing other than he was in and out of foster care throughout his younger years. At the age of 13, while still in 7th grade at school, the equivalent of year 8 in the UK, he ran away from his Pennsylvanian foster home and hitchhiked across the country to California. He spent the following few years drifting between Chicago and the West Coast, riding the trains across the country on this 2,000 mile journey. He earned a living through odd jobs, never staying in one place for very long. In 1964, at the age of 20, Greenwood committed his first known murder. A 64-year-old homeless man by the name of David Russell was found on the steps of the Los Angeles Public Library. His throat had been cut and there were numerous stab wounds across his body. Less than 24 hours later, the body of 67-year-old Benjamin Hornberg was found in the second floor bathroom of a dingy hotel where he lived. Again, the victim's throat had been slashed from ear to ear and there were numerous stab wounds on his upper body and head. Los Angeles police immediately saw similarities between the two killings and believed that they had a serial killer on their streets. However, the murders stopped as abruptly as they had started and the investigation into David and Benjamin's deaths soon ran cold. Greenwood had returned to Chicago and unknown to the Los Angeles Police Department and unconnected to the Los Angeles murders, he had been arrested and imprisoned for a knifing assault in May 1966. Greenwood had demanded cash from a man, Mance Porter, following a sexual encounter in a hotel. When 70-year-old Mance refused, Greenwood slashed his throat and stabbed him repeatedly. When Mance screamed for help, the hotel manager, William Pump, ran into the room where he was also attacked and stabbed by Greenwood. Both of the victims survived to testify at the trial. Greenwood was convicted of two counts of aggravated battery and sentenced to prison terms of eight to ten years and four to five years, which were to run concurrently. He served just five and a half years of his sentence at the Joliet and Menard Correctional Facility in Southern Illinois. Greenwood was released on January 3rd, 1973, at which point he once again travelled to the West Coast. Following this, there have been no crimes which could be attributed to Greenwood until December 1974. However, many believe that there may have been many more victims during this period. On December 1st, 1974, Greenwood returned to the Skid Row area of Los Angeles where he murdered 46-year-old Charles Jackson. Charles was an alcoholic and drifter and was murdered in the exact spot that David Russell had been found 10 years earlier. Just one week later, on December 8th, Greenwood murdered 47-year-old Moses Yakanak. Moses was knifed to death in a Skid Row alley. LAPD linked these killings to the two that had taken place 10 years earlier and knew that they had a serial killer roaming their city. 
Only three days after the murder of Moses, another body was found. The victim was 54-year-old Arthur Dahlstead, who was found outside an abandoned building, again in the same area, with his throat slashed and multiple stab wounds. The killings continued and on December 22nd, 1974, 42-year-old David Perez was found in some shrubbery very close to the Los Angeles Public Library where both David Russell and Charles Jackson had been previously found. After 18 days without another body, police investigators were starting to question whether the killer had disappeared again but January 9th brought the discovery of another victim. Kazimir Strowinski was found murdered in his room at the Pickwick Apartment Hotel on South Grand Avenue, a stopover for transients. Kazimir was 58 years old. Eight days later, on January 17th, the body of 46-year-old Robert Shanahan was discovered by a hotel maid in his room at the McDonald Apartment Hotel on South Valencia Street with a bayonet protruding from his chest. The final victim in the Skid Row area was 49-year-old Samuel Suarez who was found in room 528 at the Barclay Hotel with his throat slashed and numerous stab wounds. At this point, Greenwood changed his hunting ground, moving from Los Angeles Skid Row to Hollywood. On January 29, 1975, he stabbed George Frias to death in his own apartment. George was different to Greenwood's other victims. He was not a drifter and worked as a secretary at the Los Angeles Hilton Hotel. He lived in a modern apartment block which had a swimming pool in a much nicer area of town. Greenwood had moved away from Skid Row and now it felt as though no one was safe. Police promised the most concentrated effort since the Manson killings. Then, just two days later, he killed Clyde Hayes in his own apartment one block north of Sunset Boulevard. All of the so-called slasher victims had their throats cut from ear to ear and had multiple stab wounds. There was also evidence that Greenwood drank the blood of his victims. They were all ritually posed and he left cups of blood and rings of salt around their bodies. Greenwood also removed his victim's shoes and left them facing towards their bodies. These rituals have led to some people questioning whether these murders were in some way linked to Satanism. Los Angeles police had by now formed a profile of their suspect. This described him as a white male in his late 20s or early 30s, six feet tall and approximately 190 pounds. Ultimately, this police profile did not help with their case as Vaughan Greenwood was a 32-year-old black man. He was further described as a sexually impotent coward who was venting his own feelings of worthlessness on derelicts and down-and-outers as he strongly identifies with the people he kills and is trying to resolve his inner conflicts by turning his wrath and hatred outwards. They correctly assumed he was a poorly educated loner. The change in method of his crime would ultimately lead to Greenwood's downfall. On February 2nd, 1975, he invaded the Hollywood home of William Graham. He assaulted William with a hatchet. Unknown to Greenwood, William had a house guest, Kenneth Richer, who rushed to William's aid. In the commotion that followed, Kenneth and Greenwood fell through a glass window, enabling Greenwood to escape. Later that same evening, Greenwood attempted to break into the home of Hollywood actor Burt Reynolds. During this break-in, unbelievably, 
Greenwood dropped a letter that was addressed to himself in the driveway. This gave the Los Angeles Police Department the break that they were looking for. Police arrested Greenwood, charging him with the attempted burglary and assault. They then searched his home and found a pair of cufflinks that had been stolen from his 10th victim, George Frias. On January 1976, Greenwood was indicted on 11 counts of murder. While awaiting trial for these 11 murders, Greenwood was convicted of assaulting William Graham and Kenneth Richer, for which he was sentenced to 32 years in prison. He then stood trial for the murder of the 11 men. The prosecutor linked Greenwood to the various crimes through bloody footprints at the scene and the cufflinks belonging to George Frias. The strongest evidence was a bloody shoe print found in the McDonald apartment hotel where Robert Shanahan was murdered. A police expert testified that the footprint was made by a shoe belonging to Greenwood. The jury of seven men and five women began their deliberations on December 20th with a three-day break for the Christmas holiday. They returned their decision on December 30th they found Greenwood guilty of nine counts of murder. The jurors failed to reach a decision as to whether he was guilty of the 1964 murder of David Russell and the first of the 1974 slasher murders, that of Charles Jackson. A mistrial was declared on these two charges. Greenwood was then sentenced to nine life terms on 19th of January 1977 the judge stated that his presence in any community would constitute a menace and recommended that he is never released. To this day, he remains incarcerated at the California Men's Colony. Hi, I hope you found that story interesting. I would like to say a massive thank you to each and every one of you that have taken the time to listen, share, subscribe and comment on my videos. I also wanted to thank Briefcase and Mortis Media for their excellent support. I shall be uploading another true crime story next Wednesday. Until then, goodbye.